Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Defense Systems Information Analysis Center, or DSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. DSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the defense systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the defense systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the Defense Systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD Defense Systems research. Well, thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Brian Benish with DSIAC. Uh, that was our first uh, premiere of our little intro webinar video. So hopefully everyone was able to see that and, and enjoy that. Um, I, I would just encourage if you have any more questions or want to get some more information on DSIAC and you're not familiar with us, uh, the website is the best place to go to get um, information about who we are, what we do, and how you, we, can, we can help you with your work. Um, I'm excited today to have Jem and George uh, present his material. And Gemini, if you wanted to go ahead and you can do your screen share, get that set up um, while I'm doing a quick intro. Before um, I kind of hand the, the mic, so to speak, over to Gemini for his presentation, just wanted to give everybody a quick um, note about some logistics for any meeting as you're in here for this webinar um, presentation. For those who were, first of all, for those who are dialed in and not part of the any meeting um, platform, you can, of course, obviously listen as you are. If you need to download the slides, they're available on the DSIAC.org website. If you, if you find this webinar webpage um, under our, our webinar section of our website, you can get a link to directly download the slides and you can follow along. Um, for those who are in the Any Meeting platform, um, you can um, submit a question at any time. We'll have a, a question and answer portion at the end of the presentation, but at any time during the presentation, I would encourage you to submit a question and we'll uh, respond to them at the end in the order they're received. To submit a question, there should be an audience questions um, icon at the top middle of your screen, and that's where you can go to, to submit your question. I do want to distinguish that from the, the chat. So you'll see a chat feature on the left-hand side of the, uh, the window. Um, that's, that's simply for chatting. If you want to submit a question, again, please use the question uh, submission area icon that's in the, the top middle of the screen. Um, and then just kind of final note, if, there, if you do have any technical issues at any point throughout, um, just rest assured that not only is this presentation available, but we are recording this and can make this available to you afterwards for um, review at, at any time. So with that, uh, I will hand the time over to Jemin. Uh, I can maybe give an introduction to, to who you are, what you do, and then and dive right into your presentation. Jemin, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Brian. Uh, can you uh, see my screen? Yep, you're good, and you've got nice little red laser mouse there for us. Okay, great. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Brian and team and, and, and the folks at DSIRC for uh, providing this opportunity. Um, I'm Jamin George and I'm a research engineer with the Army Research Laboratory. And the lab is mainly located in the East Coast, a little north of DC, but we have extended campuses throughout the continental US. Um, as the Army's uh, corporate research lab, our work focus on cutting edge scientific discoveries and transition of technologies into the hands of the warfighters to improve their chances of winning in any future conflict. As a researcher, my focus mainly is centered around artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, spe specifically for the application of those uh, techniques for large-scale multi-agent systems. 
Uh, today I'll be presenting a small portion of that effort uh, where we will be focusing on how we can apply reinforcement learning to control S1. Uh, in simpler terms, I will be presenting um, applying some of the work that we did when we look at applying machine learning to control a large-scale multi-agent system to achieve uh, multiple goals optimally. Uh, completing, a, completing a mission or a goal in an optimal manner is what is important here. Uh, with that, uh, this, is an, this is an outline of the talk. Uh, first, I will give you a quick summary of our effort. And in order to do that, we consider a swarm of autonomous agents. And here the dots represents, uh, or the nodes represents the agents and, and the edges or the lines represents the communication links or the interaction links between the agents. And we would like this uh, swarm to complete a mission in a such a way that would minimize some objective. Um, here, X denotes the state of the multi-agent system and U represents the control input. So the problem is to find an optimal controller or optimal policy, U, that would minimize your objective. And you could think of this objective uh, corresponding to the swarm dividing into multiple teams to do some sort of a, a target tracking or the swarm dividing into smaller teams to do some sort of cooperative transportation of some heavy equipment. Uh, and to give you some concrete examples of what constitute the system state and the control input, uh, we consider a quad rotor. Uh, for the quad rotor, the system states are X, Y, Z positions um, and the orientation angles, uh, roll pitch yo, and the speed in X, Y, Z, those are X dot, Y dot, and C dot. Here dot represents the, uh, uh, the time derivative or the rate of change with respect to time in those uh, coordinates and the angular rates uh, P, Q, and R. Um, and the control inputs here are the speed of each of the rotors. So the control input dimension is four, corresponding to four rotors, and the state vector dimension is 12. How the control input influences the system state is given by system dynamics. Um, in general, it looks something similar to this, uh, dx dt or x dot equals f of x u, f is a function, um, which denotes how the current state and the current control input would influence the change, the rate of change of your state, state of the system. So given the current state and the input, one can use this uh, equation, uh, dynamics to predict the future states. Uh, but the issue typically is that you don't know this function. You don't know how your control influences your states. And there is oftentimes there is external disturbances, unknown um, the forces acting on your system, uh, which is not captured by the model that you have. Uh, so finding an optimal input or optimal policy, um, given that you don't know the precise mapping F is the problem of reinforcement learning control. Uh, but I will be getting that into that uh, problem in more detail soon. Uh, for simplicity, we would we will be considering linear systems here. Linear systems meaning the system state and the control input appear linearly in the dynamics. Uh, so A and B, these are called system matrices. They are they, they those are um, matrices simply just multiplying the system states and the control input U. Um, and we will only be focusing on quadratic objective where the state and the control input appear quadratically, as shown here. And the Q and the R are performance matrices. And the first portion of the quadratic objective captures the system performance, how well the, the team is achieving the task assigned to them. And the second term captures the uh, is, 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 try, is trying to penalize the control input or the power consumed to achieve the objective. So we want to achieve our objective as close as possible at the same time, minimize the effort, control effort put in, in achieving it. And this problem is typically referred to as the linear quadratic regulator problem or LQR. And for SimpleCity, we'll be focusing on this, but a lot of the approaches can be extended to um, nonlinear systems with the non-quadratic objective. 
um, with some caveat. Okay, so why is this a difficult problem? Why is finding a U that would minimize some objective while achieving your mission, uh, why is this a difficult problem? Well, there are two reasons. One is the uncertainty involved, which include uh, individual system uncertainty, uh, the uncertainty in the function f I just mentioned, as well as the uncertain uh, dynamics involved in the complex agent-to-agent -agent interactions. You may be able to model the individual dynamics of the agents, but how the agent cooperatively behave when there's a large number of agents involved, and that complex agent-to-agent -agent interaction is hard to model. And also there is uncertainty in the environment the agents are operating in. Um, and the second issue is the sheer size of the scale. Um, and that process a big challenge. Uh, for example, the single code voter that we just considered, uh, it has a state with a dimension 12. So if you con just consider just 10 of those agents, your multi-agent system has a uh, state of dimension 120. So you could, you could see the state dimension as well as the control input dimension uh, increases as you add more and more agents to your multi-agent system or, or to your swarm. <clears throat> so reinforcement learning control or adaptive optimal control is one way to tackle the uncertainty problem. Uh, so it tries to find the optimal input or optimal policy for the agent um, even if you don't have access to the precise model or precise uh, um, dy system dynamics. Um, and this talk, a lot of our work, is trying to address the scalability issue. Um, we're not, we are not trying to come up with new reinforcement learning algorithms. We are trying to uh, find out um, good approaches, a good way to apply existing uh, reinforcement learning type algorithms to control large scale multi-agent system. So in a nutshell, our approach involves breaking down the large scale swarm into smaller teams um, as given here. And within each of the teams, um, there is strong coupling between the agents, but between the teams, the coupling is weak. Um, in the second portion of the talk, I will cover different ways to compose uh, the, the swarm into smaller teams, but for now we will assume the decomposition is given. Um, once you do that, you could then decompose the objective into local objectives and global objectives. So if we decompose the swarm into n teams, we would have n local objective as given by this term, and then a coupled global objective. Um, once you do that, individual teams can then go ahead and solve for the optimal UI stars uh, that correspond to the local objectives. Um, and then uh, the corrections to the local controllers to um, account for the coupling global objective, uh, which is the UG uh, terms given here. So the first uh, controllers correspond to optimal response to this uh, decoupled local objectives. And each of the teams can do that, and they could make use of existing uh, algorithms because now the problem is much smaller because we have divided the swarm into smaller teams. And, and they could do that in parallel too. They could compute this UI stars in parallel or U, UJ stars in parallel. And once they do that, they, they need to coordinate and come up with these uh, corrections they need to make to the local controller to account for the coupling objective. So that is the approach in a nutshell. Uh, so if you if you take one thing away from this talk and and that should this should be it that the reinforcement learning provides a way to um, optimally control uncertain uh, dynamic systems and applying reinforcement learning optimally to control a swarm, uh, we take uh, up the approach of uh, divide and Conquer. We divide the swarm into smaller teams, and each team um, then would construct their own local optimal controllers while jointly synthesizing corrections to these local controllers to account for the global objective. So that was the overview of our work. Um, now I will get into the technical details and the main body of the talk. Uh, but first, I will consider 
I will quickly go over um, the reinforcement learning control problem and present uh, some of the existing solutions. So again, uh, like I said, we will be considering linear systems with quadratic uh, objective. Uh, again, if you will consider a single linear system of this form, x dot equals ax plus bu, here again, x is the system state, u is the control input. And we would like to find the U that minimizes this control objective. Um, and the solutions to that problem is a simple linear feedback controller. So you take the system state and feed it back into the controller following this, this relation. And here K is the optimal controller gain. And that is uh, obtained by um, solving this algebraic Riccardi equation. Um, and, and this problem is referred to as the linear quadratic regulator problem, as I mentioned uh, earlier. Now, the, and such a controller is very good at uh, um, uh, rejecting any disturbances acting on the system. So we are looking at three different controllers. The first one is a low gain proportional controller. Now we are looking at a high gain proportional controller, and you can see a lots of oscillations um, to that rejection, uh, to that disturbances. Um, and then when you apply a um, LQR controller, the, the rejection is, uh, is much smoother, meaning there is no overshoot, there is no oscillations, and it's, um, there's good um, robustness associated with the controller. Uh, that's what I was trying to show there. Play that again, and you can see a lot, lot, lot of oscillations, oscillations as the uh, system come back to its uh, steady state. Um, and then once you apply the LQR, you can see it's pretty quick. Uh, the oscillations goes away. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, the, what exactly is a reinforcement learning problem? Uh, the reinforcement learning in comes in um, because uh, in order to solve this Riccardi equation to obtain the optimal gain, the controller gain, um, you need to know system matrices A and B. But like I said, a lot of the times uh, the system dynamics is uncertain. So you, don't, you may not have access to these matrices A and B. And the reinforcement learning problem involves finding a solutions to this Riccardi equation or finding the optimal controller when the system dynamics is uncertain. Um, so the unknown, unknown dy uh, system dynamics, um, um, which implies system response to the control input is unknown. And the reinforcement learning provides a way to uh, find an optimal solution. Um, so uh, one solution to this problem is this uh, so-called adaptive dynamic programming. And it is as simple as you you pick an initial controller that has to be a stable controller, and you apply that controller to your system with some uh, exploratory noise added to it. And then you collect uh, your system states, and you construct a bunch of matrices uh, denoted by this delta i. Um, once you com com uh, construct those matrices, you could go ahead and solve for your uh, solution to the Riccardi equation and your optimal controller gain and you check if the solution converges. If not, you iteratively do this until your solution converges. And it can be shown that at the end, uh, when it converges, it does converge to the optimal solution. Um, so you, you take an initial gain, you apply, add some noise, and you apply that noisy input to your system. Um, you collect the state and the input information, and you solve for this um, linear least squares problem iteratively to obtain your solution. But the issue of applying this algorithm to a large scale multi-agent system or to a swarm is the fact that uh, um, we would have to uh, pull all the information from all the agents to solve this uh, centrally. And that poses unrealistic communication and computational overhead um, communication because uh, scale of the problem now increases, and uh, collecting the state information from all the agents to a central location, that involves a lot of communication overhead. Um, 
So our uh, work tried to address the scalability issue associated with this or solve the communication and the computational overhead associated with it. So now I will get into the problem formulation. Um, again, uh, we take the, the swarm of P agents, we divide it into N groups. Each of the groups have P sub J agents. And this is a group level linear dynamics. Again, we are sticking to linear uh, dynamics to be able to better explain and better formulate the problem. Um, and if you were to aggregate all the group level or the all the N group level dynamics, you have the swarm level um, linear dynamics. And again, our control objective is quadratic. And the optimal controller is given here, which involves solving a extremely large uh, matrix algebraic Riccardi equation. Um, and we cannot solve this because the system model is unknown, A and B are unknown, and you cannot naively apply the existing algorithms uh, because um, that involves quite a lot of communication and computation. Uh, before I go ahead, I would like to point out that there is no physical coupling uh, meaning the dynamics of the individual agents are not coupled. To be, these are individual uh, autonomous agents. So there is no dynamic coupling here. And that means this large calligraphic A is just block diagonal matrix. There is no ith agent uh, does not influence the jth agent. Excuse me. Uh, the coupling comes in through the control objective. And I will get into that in details here. So. Excuse me. So here is our control objective, the quadratic control objective. Um, the control penalty matrix R, we assume is to be diagonal. There is no coupling there, so that is good. But the uh, performance matrix, the straight, the state performance matrix Q, has two terms. One is Q bar, and the other one is Q tilde multiplied by this uh, LW matrix. Q bar is diagonal, so that is good. But the coupling term is this the second term. Well, LW denotes which agent needs to cooperate with which other agent or which other team, if you're considering team level, um, to achieve the mission. So this L correspond to the, the cooperation matrix or the interaction matrix between the teams or the agents. And this uh, Q tilde is some uh, fully populated matrix. So this is a coupling term that, that would cause issues um, that would not allow the individual agents to go ahead and do their own uh, local uh, strategy. <laughs> so now we'll get into the solution. Um, so our uh, approach involves taking the um, global objective and breaking down into local and the coupling matrix. So the local Decoupled portion correspond to the R. R is diagonal, like I said, so there is no coupling there. Um, and the Q bar, uh, again, that is also a diagonal matrix. There is no coupling there. And the coupled term. Um, and this follows from the uh, the same strategy of take, divide and conquer. We're taking the swarm and dividing into smaller teams, so N teams, so you have N local objectives. Um, and this is a coupling uh, global objective. And, and, uh, and then once you do that, the individual teams or the individual agents uh, can then go ahead and solve for the local objective using by solving the uh, local Riccati equation corresponding to the local objective. Um, and they could use existing uh, ADP type algorithm, existing approximate dynamic programming or adaptive dynamic programming type of algorithms to do that, uh, to construct the optimal solutions to the local objective. Uh, once they do that, um, they go ahead and define a new control penalty matrix, R, calligraphic R, um, that involves the original control penalty term plus some R tilde. Um, and um, and the R tilde term is, is selected such that the, um, before I get into that, um, <coughs> so yeah, um, a new control penalty term. And then this is a Riccardi equation corresponding to this global objective. All I did was I plugged in the Q, which has two terms, Q bar and Q tilde. There's a Q bar, here's a Q tilde. 
And then the R, this new R, again, that has two terms too, this R, original R, this R tilde. And then if you go ahead and select the R tilde such that this relation holds, then the whatever the coupling terms cancel each other. So we select the R tilde that we added to the control penalty term to cancel out the coupling term in our state object, the Q tilde term. And then what we end with what's in the green, what's in the green is just the block diagonal Riccati matrix, uh, which we already solved at local level. Um, and then uh, we could construct the controller gain using both the R and R tilde. R correspond to the local controller. R tilde correspond to the corrections to the local controller to account for this coupling term. Um, so uh, uh, for the sake of time, I want to get into this. So to summarize this, this is, a, this is the three-step approach. You take the swarm, you divide it into smaller teams, and you have team level objective. And each of the teams could solve the team level objectives in parallel using some existing algorithms. Once they do that, they construct this R tilde term such that this relation holds, uh, where P is the uh, aggregated matrix of individual solutions to these local objectives, uh, this calligraphic P. Um, so you find an R tilde that satisfies this relation. Once you do that, you could construct the um, local controller and the corrections to the local controller using this relation. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, we are effectively minimizing a new objective, not the original objective. The original objectives involve uh, Q and R. Now we have Q bar and R calligraphic R. and uh, um, and Q bar is defined, uh, yeah, Q bar will be same as uh, this term. Um, so that's why we call it an approximate controller because now we are saying, now we are solving for a, a different control objective, not the original one. So there is some perf uh, performance loss, uh, which is uh, the performance loss is shown here. But uh, so here is an example, uh, just a numerical example we did using uh, different scenarios. Uh, here n correspond to the number of teams in the in the swarm or number of clicks in the swarm, and c correspond to the number of agents per team. Uh, for example, this is uh, a multi-agent system with three teams. This is one, two, and three. Each of the teams have uh, three agents. And n is the dimensionality of the state vector for individual agents, and m is the dimensionality of the control input for individual agents. And the first two columns shows the time taken by the existing reinforcement learning controller and our proposed uh, hierarchical reinforcement learning controller. And here is the performance of the existing optimal RL, our approach, and the last column is the optimality gap, which is taking the difference between um, our performance and the optimal performance and dividing by the optimal performance. So this is the percentage loss. And you can see that as the swarm gets bigger, about four teams, and each of the teams have four agents in it, and the state dimension is also large. And you can see that the RL, existing RL takes more than 60 seconds to converge to a solution while ours converges less than uh, 10 seconds. So that is the computational advantage of our algorithm because it converges faster, less computation is involved. As, um, but there is a catch, is there is an optimality loss, but uh, for this particular scenario, it's only 5%. And you can see that the optimality gas gap decreases as you have more and more agents involved. And if you're interested in more learning more about this result, you could check out our um, paper at the American Control Conference that was presented last year. And for homogeneous, so that was for heterogeneous agents. Each of the agents have their own uh, A and B matrices, system dynamics, and they don't have to be identical. But if you consider homogeneous agents, each of the agents are identical. Uh, A and B are identical across all the agents. 
and the performance matrices Q and R are also identical across all the agents. Then you could do some sort of similarity transformation to transform your X into new state chi and to control U into new state V. And then the problem becomes decoupled and the individual agents can solve it in parallel um, without communicating amongst themselves. But once you construct the V, they cannot apply V uh, to, the, to the system because uh, the controller has to be in the in, in, in same coordinate, coordinate as you. So you have, to go, you have to go back into the original coordinate. Um, and in order to do that, the agents have to coordinate the transformation from V to U. Uh, that has to be coordinated across the agents. So in other words, each of the agents can do the learning in parallel if the agents are homogeneous agents, but in order to implement, uh, there has to be some sort of uh, uh, central coordination, but that's, that, that coordination is fast enough. Um, learning is what actually takes time, but uh, we have an approach that would parallelize it. Uh, but the, the, the good thing is the final controller is optimal. There is no optimality gap, uh, like in the heterogeneous agent case. Um, and this is just showing uh, uh, performance uh, the, the performance improvement when you apply our hierarchical reinforcement learning or some customized version of the hierarchical reinforcement learning. And you can see that compared to the RL, uh, okay, here P corresponds to the number of agents and N corresponds to the state dimension and M is the input dimension. And you can see that uh, th there's a drastic improvement in computational time when you go from existing algorithm to our algorithm. So that clearly shows the computational advantage. Um, now I would like to uh, get into some of the uh, okay. hold on a minute. I would have to restart my PowerPoint in a minute. Uh, yeah, now I will get into some uh, formation control simulations. Um, so the simulation, it corresponds to, there's a bunch of agents, uh, a multi-agent system corresponding to uh, a bunch of agents that they have, they are initially at some initial uh, position and they would like to go from the initial position to assign target and keep a formation about the target. That's the problem. Um, and uh, um, yeah, for the, for the uh, say interest of time, I'm not gonna get into the uh, details of the problem formulation, but <clears throat> this is uh, one scenario where we consider um, some sort of coupling uh, between the agents, but the coupling is scaled down to uh, scaled down by a factor of 0.5. Um, so here, these are the trajectories taken by the agents from the initial position to the final configuration. The solid lines are the optimal trajectory, and the dotted lines are the trajectory taken by the agents. Uh, applying our algorithm. And you can see that they are very similar. Uh, nothing surprising there because uh, the coupling objective is, um, is scaled down and the coupling objective is what actually causes performance loss. So there's less performance loss because of the uh, small coupling. Once you crank up the coupling and you can start to see a lot more performance loss, um, but uh, they do go in. They do go to their final desired location. But the how the way they reach there, or the control effort they put into reach there, are different. That is the point. Um, and that discrepancy increases as you increase the coupling between the edges. And this coupling corresponds to some sort of flocking behavior, meaning the agents have to keep their velocity um, in some sort of relation as they coordinately. Uh, uh, move from their original position to the final configuration. 
Um, and now I will get into the decomposition portion. Um, like I said, I, in, in the previous example, we assume the scenario is such that uh, the decomposition of the swarm is, is known. In the tracking example, there were, uh, there were four targets. So the team has to divide into four and we assign the, um, the agents to which uh, that team. But oftentimes that assignment is not known. You don't know how many agents need to assign to each of the teams. So that's what we, the decomposition problem is looking at that. Um, in order to do that, we take the coupling matrix L, we, de we decompose into two matrices, G and G1 and G2. G1 correspond to coupling within the T. Uh, and the, this shows which agent is in, in a team. So here you have three teams. Agent one and two are in one team. Agent three is in its own team and agent uh, four and five in another team. And there's another um, uh, coupling or decomposition of the same uh, coupling matrices where you consider, you only consider two teams. One, two, and three are in one team and four and five in, in another team. And G2 correspond to the coupling between the teams. Uh, which team can talk to which? which other team. Um, but in order to do the um, uh, decomposition, we look at uh, two approaches. One uh, try, uh, approach is uh, trying to minimize the optimality gap. Um, optimality, in the per in, in, you mean the performance obtained by applying our hierarchical controller to the optimal use star. Uh, we want a coupling that minimizes that. And that, that often corresponds to either um, decreasing the trace of the G2 that I just showed or the condition number of the solution to the Riccardi equation. Um, and another strategy is to, you want to do a decomposition such that the interagent communication link is minimized. You want to minimize the uh, communication overhead. Uh, the first one is trying to minimize the performance loss. The second one is trying to minimize the communication overhead. Um, I don't want to get into this. So this is another example where you have 12 agents, um, you have three leaders and nine followers. The leaders are denoted by uh, the dark dotted line, dots. So they want to go from some initial configuration to final configuration to get through some corridor. Um, so the problem is which agents need to associate it with which other agent. And that's a decomposition problem. Only the leaders know where to go. The followers have to uh, look at the leaders and associate it with the leaders and keep some sort of formation about the leader. But the leader know the absolute position where they need to go to. Um, and uh, so this is the performance. If you assume um, a fully connected or an optimal centralized strategy, this is the performance. Um, and these are the values a performance matrix that we, performance index we get. Um, this is if we apply some sort of a distributed but non-optimal strategy, agents here, all the agents need to talk to everybody else. Here, they don't need to talk to everybody else. They only need to talk to their neighbors, uh, but the performance is very bad. You could see a lot of transient and oscillations um, and the performance uh, measure you could see is much higher. I mean, uh, much lower, however you look at it. And this is a performance that we got by applying our uh, controller. However, um, we consider it for different scenarios. So this is one scenario where I show that there's three leaders um, and uh, the blue is one team associated with one leader. The red is another team associated with the red leader and the yellow leader is here. And we consider three different association A and B and these are the performance associated with uh, configuration A and the decomposition strategy A or the decomposition strategy B. And you can see that A is the best uh, decomposition strategy we consider because the performance loss is only 0.82 percentage. Uh, that's that. And uh, so um, besides the simple simulations that, we, that I just showed, we are also trying to evaluate the algorithm in AirSim or the Aerial Informatics and Robotics Simulator owned by Microsoft. Uh, it's an open platform. Uh, 
and you could even integrate with uh, external controllers. Um, so here, this is a quick uh, demo of, uh, um, uh, let's skip that one for the sake of time. And <clears throat> so a quick demo of uh, individual agents uh, um, are taking off and trying to keep formation about two moving targets. I don't know if you can see, but these moving targets are, uh, are here. Uh, and here is a better uh, simulation. Again, you have two moving targets, and the swarm uh, detects uh, once once the detection of these moving targets is sent to the swarm, they divide into two teams, and one team get us comes and keep the formation about one moving target, while the other uh, comes and keep a formation about the uh, about the other moving target. So these are some of the uh, simulation experiments that we do, and we do plan on doing some sort of a hardware experiment in the coming future. Um, but with that, uh, get into the conclusion. Um, I showed that reinforcement learning is a way to optimally control uh, agents, but if you want to apply that to a swarm or a multi-agent system, we would have to do some sort of a divide and conquer approach where you divide the swarm into smaller teams, and then teams apply their local optimal controllers. They synthesize local optimal controllers while they coordinately, um, uh, coordinately synthesize a, a correction to the local controllers to account for the coupling objective. Um, for heterogeneous multi-agent system, um, there is some optimality gap, but for homogeneous uh, multi-agent system, um, you could uh, do all this in parallel do the learning in parallel, but the implementation has to be coordinated, and but then there is no uh, optimality loss. And we also, I also showed different ways to decompose the multi-agent system. And here are some references, and I would like to acknowledge our collaborators. With that, I conclude my talk and um, open to any questions. Oh, that was great. Appreciate it. And, uh... The, the simulation at the end was was very insightful too. It was, looks looks great. Um, we did get a couple questions that came in uh, during the presentation, but again, just for those who are uh, listening now, you you can submit them through the little the Q and A portion uh, icon, I guess, at the top middle of the screen. And so, uh, without further ado, let's let's jump into a couple of these. Um, and I, um, oh, hey, do you know what? Uh, do you mind? Turning off your screen share for me, uh, Jim. There we go. And I'll, there we go. All right. Um, so unfortunately, these don't come. They, they don't identify uh, when they came in on what slide you were on. So uh, hopefully, we can interpret what slide this might be relevant to, or just you can identify what's going on here. But I'll read the question and give you a chance to re respond. Uh, so the question here is: uh, Does this reduce Q and R to approximate block diagonal with sparse off diagonal? Again, hard to identify what this in particular is meant to refer to, but hopefully you can discern. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm assuming he is referring to the decomposition of uh, the swarm into smaller teams and, mm -hmm. and trying to... Um, so um, when you decompose that, uh, that you have to take into account how the original, uh, th there's no issue with R because R is a uh, um, block diagonal to begin with. So we, because the control penalty on each of the agent is, is independent. So we assume R is block diagonal. So the issue is with Q. So when we decompose, we do have to take into account how Q um, uh, dictates how the agents collaborate. So the block diagonal portion of the Q um, decide which uh, agents are associated with in which of the teams, and the off um, diagonal entries are the ones that are are the coupling, and that is what we are trying to um, uh, account for by doing some sort of uh, corrections to the the optimal controller that the the team saw locally. Um, mm. So the um, yeah, so we, we are trying to approximate the off-diagonal 
uh, entries of Q matrix okay. using 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 uh, by adjusting the R, which is diagonal to begin with. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Gotcha. No, that, that sounds like you you hit it. Let's jump to the next one. <clears throat> next question says, "How many agents are you worried about, and in what problem context is breaking down the agents into multiple groups a good idea?" Yes, so that is depending on your um, scenario. So if, for the uh, simulation that I showed towards the end, um, where I had about 10 agents, uh, the, 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 the two shooters and the, the UAVs are tracking those two shooters, the 10 agents. Um, at that point, um, even for that simple scenario, it, we are having difficulty trying to coordinate that uh, on a GPU machine, um, get that simulation running. So um, if you wanted to do some sort of uh, lear learning on the fly on using these agents, um, it depends on what is your, how, how much time can you afford, how much computation that you can afford uh, to completing the, uh, the learning and constructing the optimal policy or the optimal control input. Um, if, you have, if you have enough computation and enough uh, um, uh, communication capability uh, and enough time to learn, then, then um, the, the, there is no issue. But even 10 agents can pose an issue um, if, you, if, you are restricted, if you restrict those computation time resources over. No, good point. Yeah, good bounds for the identifying when you break it down. Okay. Um, next question, somewhat lengthy, but we'll go ahead and read it out and see what you have to say in response. Okay. So the question is, why must you divide this form into teams? Is the control problem complexity such that available computing power at the edge is insufficient to provide control as a single strongly linked unit where each unit solving in parallel to all others? Does a team approach uh, provide benefits over providing each swarm member supercomputing for AI at the edge? For example, in NVIDIA, Jetson, and Xavier NX. And is the swap of the individual swarm entities too small to support something like this? Yes. So the, the main reason we divide the agents into uh, multiple teams is that, sure, you can, you can start looking into um, uh, you know the high performance uh, uh, computing technologies and um, have that capability some way embedded onto these individual agents. However, uh, there's the issue of communication. Um, so how does in the let's say you, you you're considering again this uh, ten agent uh, simple example of ten agents. Um, uh, if you were to cons if you don't divide the swarm into um, smaller teams. In our case, it was uh, ten, uh, two teams of five agencies. Um, and when you try to learn a controller or solve the problem, then all 10 agents need to know the state information and the input information of all the other 10 agents. So a lot more communication is involved. Um, once you get that information, then individual agents have to solve for a controller, but then they would be um, the way the algorithm works is that you it's not possible for you to only solve for your portion of the controller because when you solve you get you do get the solutions to the entire swarm so and and individual agents don't need to know what the control input for the the rest of the nine agents are um, mm -hmm. that is another issue um, yeah so uh, by dividing the agents into smaller teams then the teams can um, um, suggest a coordinator uh, or a leader that can then uh, in charge of uh, uh, collecting the state information from individual agents. Uh, but then that only involves a small number of agents. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I hope I convinced you with the examples and the running time that I showed um, where the centralized algorithm took over 60 seconds to converge while our proposed algorithm, uh, you know, converts less than 10, uh, 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, so speeding up the process uh, is, is, is a big advantage. And we didn't even capture the communication 
advantage. And the the experiments and the simulations that we are doing would allow us to do that, capture that yeah. communication advantage. No, that's good. Yeah, great. Um, next question here, you should see it on the screen. It says, uh, with only quadratic penalties, how can you guarantee no collisions? Yes, so no collision can also be uh, built into um, um, uh, built into the uh, collision avoidance algorithm. For example, you could consider quadratic uh, uh, potential functions to uh, to make sure that the as the agents gets closer and closer, um, the penalty term the, the penalty on the decrease in their um, uh, relative position is exponentially cranked up so that they don't they don't go below certain threshold meaning they always keep some sort of a, um some sort of a, um a distance between them uh, that, that can yeah um yeah okay that's good all right uh next question are safe separation constraints embedded in the cost functions or function so, singular? Yes, yes. So this is also getting back to the previous uh, question. Uh, there are uh, potential function approaches that, that allow you to have some sort of uh, soft constraints on this interagent spacing, um, quadratic uh, object uh, potential functions. Um, mm -hmm. However, however, uh, you could also consider you could also consider non-quadratic objectives, um, and the reason. The reason that we stick to linear quadratic uh, approach is to build up the algorithm and to theoretically guarantee some sort of performance and to show some proof of concept. We are considering non-quadratic, non-linear uh, scenarios, uh, but uh, in, in, for that we are specifically looking at discrete time agents in, in the discrete time domain um, um, and uh, mm -hmm. those. Yeah. Uh, yes. Those results are coming out slowly, but it's not there to uh, mm -hmm. showcase it at this point. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Uh, next question. Have you seen parameter sharing in multi-agent DRL? It's been shown many times to effectively learn swarming behaviors in systems with large numbers of agents, I believe, without any divide and conquer. Uh, when it's not clear what 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 do you mean by parameter sharing are you referring to some sort of a uh consensus type algorithms or or are you even referring to the um um uh, mdpg type of algorithm um, yeah and that's not clear but um, uh, uh but yes yes we we are we are uh so um Yes, we are aware of some some uh, um, uh, algorithms that allow you to do that, and this is this is exactly what we are doing when we get into discrete time domain. Um, mm -hmm. When when you consider non quadratic and mm -hmm. non linear dynamics, there is a way you could decompose the algorithm um, in parallel and solve it in parallel, but only the agents only communicate with their neighbors. Uh, without decomposing it into teams, yes, th there are ways, and our discrete time, our discrete time effort is actually doing that. Um, okay, no, probably good. And, and if uh, there is any more follow up, Justin, you can enter it in the questions, and we'll see if we can jump to it uh, before the. Yes. Here. So yeah. So all, for all the people who asked uh, questions, I appreciate the uh, the feedback. And if you have any further. Questions or concerns, please. You you have my email address. Please uh, reach out. Right. Yeah, that's always a good final uh, reach out. Um, we do have a few more questions, so if we, we got a few more minutes here, let's see if we can get through a couple of them. Uh, next question is: uh, Is there a stability guarantee for the suboptimal problem that you end up solving? Yes. No. Good question. I there, there is. <clears throat> so. Um, Yes, there is a, a stability guarantee, uh, but the initial work um, assumes you start with the stable controller and the iterative algorithm that you apply does um, 
in, uh, make sure you still have a stabilizing but optimal controller. Um, uh, <clears throat> recently, we come up with a, um, an approach to synthesize a initially stabilizing controller. And you don't need to have a stabilizing. Uh, so you could start with any controller. And then you could use that algorithm to come up uh, to come up with that initial stabilizing controller and use that initial stabilizing controller in, in the algorithms that I showed here to come up with an optimal controller, which again, guaranteed to be stable. Mm, okay. All right, next question. Um, how do you construct the reward function for the RL agent? <clears throat> so um, for the sake of simplicity here, I focused strictly on quadratic objectives. So the state and the controller shows up quadratically in, in the control objective. But uh, in, in reality, um, um, you, you, um, well, there are two, there are two um, ways to look at it. One, uh, when you assign a mission, you know what the agents have to do. And you know what what the control? How would you like to penalize the agents? Um, so you, uh, when you assign the mission, you could come, you could get a feeling of um, what the um, reward function should be, um, or the uh, loss function should be in, in, in the case that I showed. Um, however, um, when the agents are solved, when uh, for the agents who are solving this uh, problem. Uh, we assume uh, they don't know the global reward function. That is the way that is the way we are posing the discrete domain algorithm, where we assume the agents only have access to their own local states and the states of their local agents, um, and they could use that information to compute the local portion of the reward function, um, but not the not the uh, global. At the global uh, objective. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, a uh, few more questions in queue. I'm not sure we're going to get to all of them just for the sake of time here, but we'll uh, see if we can get through a couple more here before we conclude. All right, next question Are you looking to transition this project to physical testing? Uh, to physical testing a collection of varied domain swarms, for example, UAS groups operating, collaborating with UGV teams? If so, are you looking for teammates with experience doing this for other DoD partners? Yes, de yes, definitely. I did reach out to uh, the DARPA folks who are in charge of the DARPA offset program. Um, mm -hmm. and the, the talk is going on to uh, transition some of the simulation platforms they uh, used for the DARPA offset program. But uh, Matt Dooley, I would be very interested in uh, partnering with uh, you and your team to actually um, so uh, showcase this uh, technology. We are uh, at the, the same time we are working with a few army folks and mm -hmm. a few folks, a few folks from uh, University of uh, Nebraska Lincoln to showcase uh, to do a, a experimental excursion at uh, Fort Benning um, early next year, um, mm -hmm. involving both uh, UAS platforms as well as uh, UGV platforms. Oh, good, good. There All right. Next question here. Does your non-coupling constraints on the dynamics allow for potential collisions between agents? And I guess maybe you did address the collision aspect earlier, but any more you wanted to add to that? No. Um, no, yeah. we, we could, uh, yeah, if, if collision, eat. so another another um, uh, way to look at it, look at this too, this, controller uh, is a low level controller. You could have a high level policy uh, driven controller um, that can uh, get into a lot of the, um, um, a lot of the other constraints uh, which would tell this in, uh, individual agents uh, the formation it needs to take and the red points it needs to go to and this low-level controller that I just showed is allowing you to go from that uh, in um, that waypoint to waypoint in an optimal manner. Which you want to, if you want to have a high-level uh, policy-driven, uh, high-level policy-driven controller, 
on top of this mm-hmm. to make sure other objectives are taken care of. You could you could also do that. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, you know, for the sake of time, we have one more question. We'll, we'll squeeze in here, and then I'll just uh, for everybody else whose question we weren't able to get to. Uh, again, you can certainly contact Jim directly. You can reach out to DSI, um, and we could help um, pass that along to Jim or or help respond in some way. Um, but otherwise, we'll we'll still have these questions compiled and, and get them out to you, Jim, for your interest as well. Yes. Uh, that said, this last one up here for us to discuss. So, can this approach be used for control in a non-cooperative setting, for example, against adversarial swarms? Yes. So uh, the short answer is no, uh, because mm-hmm. it does involve uh, agents cooperating with each other and sharing the their information, at least locally, with the local coordinator or their local agents. Um, if, uh, but, but that's a good point of, of um, what would happen to these algorithms if one of the agents become compromised and, and it is feeding you garbage um, mm. and, and to derail the entire mission. But that is a good point. We, we're not there yet, um, but that's a good problem. We are, uh, yeah, we would be interested in yeah. looking at that. Yeah, area for future work. It's a good way to kind of send this off and, and conclude our time. <laughs> um, Jim, did you have your, I, I don't recall on your slides if, if your email was on there or not. Um, if not, I guess I could talk to you offline whether you're comfortable us putting that in a follow-up email that we'll send to the audience. Um, alternatively, I guess everyone, of course, can go to the Global Address book and, and should be able to find you from there. Okay, so unfortunately, my email is not on the slide, but it's it's as simple as uh, my first name, jemin.george.civ at mail.mil. Okay, yeah, and, and if it's okay with you, uh, we could either add that to your slide so it's on available from the yeah. website or and or add it to... Uh, the email that we'll we'll follow up to everybody with. Sure. Okay. Well, hey, this has been great. I appreciate the the presentation, the, the response to all the questions, kind of keeping you on your toes. And um looking forward to anything, any other kind of comments, collaboration that might come out of this. So thank you, Jim, for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and thank you all the audience and thanks for all the questions. And uh, uh please reach out if you have uh ideas on how to collaborate. Um, all, we are always looking for folks to partner with to further extend the effort and actually um, getting it to the hands of the warfighter. Over. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you very much.